Harvard from Harvard, and he's an expert in causal inference, um, invariant inference, as well as statistical machine learning. Um, and he'll be talking to us about uh, sort of interference in networks. In total. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm really, truly honored to be here. Uh, this is an, uh, an excellent uh, workshop uh, and very topical uh, as well. So honored to, 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 to be part of it. Um, so this talk is about causal inference in, in complex uh, systems. And it's, I'm going to present more like a review of some prior work that I have done. I identify some of uh, the issues um, and I'll talk about my uh, amazing collaborators later. Um, okay, so the uh, standard methods of causal inference, um, whether they explicitly or implicitly um, stated, uh, they assume no interference. And no interference means that the, uh, the outcome of a unit depends only on the, on the unit's uh, treatment. It cannot be affected by other units. At least this has been the standard uh, framework of causal inference. But of course, this assumes uh, a simple and, and, and steady world. And uh, as Vivek uh, mentioned, like described, many real world settings, they do have interactions, they do have uh, situations where units uh, interact uh, in, in a dynamic way. And these type of problems are uh, just not solved. There's a, there's a lot of need for, for new tools, for methods to address these problems. And if you take into account uh, the modern problems in policy making, climate science, uh, healthcare, modern healthcare, these are all problems of causal inference in, uh, in complex systems. So now more than ever, uh, we, need, uh, we need new tools. And of course the marketplace algorithms, um, what, what described uh, Vivek um, earlier, okay? Except for TikTok, right? I don't like TikTok. Uh, so um, anyway, anything else, and everything else is important here. So the main thesis uh, like of this talk, like at the summary is going to be that um, I don't think there's a one unique solution or one unique approach in, in complex systems. Um, the solution depends on the context and every context has a different, let's say, characteristic. And I don't think there can be just one solution that, that fits everything. Um, however, I do think that the causal inference mindset, the framework can give us the foundation, like a, a unifying foundation, a common foundation to, to address our problems. And I'll try to convey that as much as possible in, in today's talk. Um, some examples to illustrate the, the kind of scope of problems that, that are out there, of course, by, this is non-exhaustive by, by any, um, uh, any means. Um, but these are problems that I have some familiarity with. Um, I have worked you know, in, kind of in, also in, uh, with actual data. Um, and I will be able to describe some of them in detail, some of them only in passing. So this one is, is from a, a real experiment uh, in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, it was a, a real experiment that uh, kind of randomized the le different levels of policing on different street, street segments. So what you see here, this map is Medellin, downtown, uh, the city of Medellin. And uh, here is a street segment. That's a, the unit of our analysis. Uh, the red one is a street segment that is in control. It means it has the baseline policing. And the blue here uh, is a street segment that received increased uh, policing. And the question is, is this, does this increased policing work do, as, as an intervention? Um, but of course, these, these things are, they're not, these street segments do not in, exist individually, right? They are part of the entire street uh, of the city. Uh, landscape. And of course, we expect that uh, street segments here are going to be affected uh, by nearby treated streets or nearby controlled st streets. Uh, for example, when you have more police presence here, uh, you know, criminals might move to that, that other control uh, street segment. Okay. That's it. That's a, that's interference, uh, which means that the outcomes that we see in that street segment, they depend on what happens uh, nearby. Okay. It's not only what happens on that street segment, it depends on what happens uh, nearby. Now, when, it, when, when we have interference, we suspect interference, it's even the definition of what we're looking for, the effects, can be complicated. Uh, and so there, I'm going to describe some recent advances in, in really just describing and kind of writing down formally what, uh, uh, what the estimate is. Um, and, and of course, then how to, to estimate it. Another example is uh, so-called treatment habituation or treatment uh, learning. Uh, this is especially um, important in cases where users kind of learn, uh, like the units learn, kind of they look into the treatment and they start learning, they adapt, uh, 
And so um, it's a special kind of interference where in some sense, even though there's no, there might not be interference between units, a unit interferes with itself, right? So what I uh, act, how I act today, it has a kind of gives me some information on how to, to act tomorrow. So whatever treatment I receive now ha has an effect on what, what I'm going to do later. So it's a kind of an interference with, with a subtemporal interference, uh, also kind of similar to what Vivek talked about earlier. Uh, and this could be a serious problem for causal inference. And I would say even econometrics and high, and high uh, profile public policy questions, it's completely ignored in the sense that we apply an intervention, we measure something, and then we, we kind of ignore the fact that um, the effect that we see, there might be a strong effect now, but down the road, the, the effect might completely like drastically change, right? So the thing about a very simple example, you run a grocery store, you increase prices overnight by uh, 100%, okay? Next day, you're going to see a huge bump in your revenue, uh, huge increase in your revenue, perhaps double. Uh, a month later, uh, you might kind of lose all your customers, okay? That's uh, kind of a, because your customers learn, they kind of habituate in the treatment. Another example, a very famous one from Alton Rogers in 2014, and they measured the effect of a mailing campaign on household energy consumption. So basically they emailed households, they said, okay, here's how you, uh, you not wasted, but here's how you consumed uh, in terms of energy, here's how your, uh, your neighborhood did, uh, and then the uh, households, they did observe that households immediately change their energy consumption, like drastically in the first month, but um, uh, their initial conservation actions were kind of halved after a couple of months. So the households habituated and then they kind of received those, those uh, mails uh, and then this uh, completely ignored them, okay? Uh, it's a big problem and um, I, uh, there's just not a good solution out there. I'll just describe something that we did with collaborators, but it's still an open problem. Um, another problem is, uh, you know, you, you try to introduce a new mechanism, like a multi-agent system, and you want to know the, the effects of that. Um, that's what perhaps Yahoo did uh, in 2008. They tried to increase the reserve prices because theory told them, classical auction theory told them that they could increase the, uh, the, the reserve price in the auctions and they could just get more revenue and not lose customers. Okay, that was a high profile experiment that happened back then. That's an especially, especially challenging causal inference problem because what you would like to measure is your system being in auction one and also your system being in auction zero um, and the baseline, uh, but you never get to, to observe it. It's exactly the problem that, that Vivek mentioned, right? You just only get to observe some, some kind of a mesh or like a combination of these two. And um, as you can see here, it didn't really go, it didn't really go that well. Uh, Yahoo was sold uh, a few years later. Uh, just a graphical illustration of that problem. And again, that's, that's pretty much what, what Vivek talked about. Uh, that was uh, Vivek's like half, let's say, uh, mechanism that you get, perhaps you get to observe. But what you really want to know is what will happen in your system if everybody was assigned uh, um, uh, auction one, what will happen if you assign auction zero? And what you really want to know is also the long-term effect, like the stationary uh, distribution of this deal. So it's a very, um, peculiar uh, causal inference problem because you just observe none of that, essentially. You only observe, get to observe this data and you want to extrapolate to these endpoints for which you just have perhaps um, little information about. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about that. It's extremely uh, hard as a problem. Uh, thankfully, uh, kind of Vivek had some, some really cool uh, results to show. It's a tough problem and it has a lot of uh, interesting uh, future directions as well. So I'll focus more on example one, examples one and two. Well, example one was this crime spillovers where it's in some sense, it's the easy case. There's, there's something we can do about that. Uh, example two, I'll just describe some, um, uh, this example two, I'll describe for habituation, I'll describe some experimental designs that we, um, uh, we, we worked on. Okay, so because causal inference means different things to different people, I just would like, first of all, to define what type of causal inference I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to focus into two different uh, types of causal inference, which I think are uh, perhaps the, the, the most uh, promising ones, or at least the ones that can offer that, that common foundation that I promised. Um, so I'm going to use Y for outcomes, Z for treatment, X for covariates, uh, features, N is the number of units in my, uh, in my sample, I will be the index of that. And I want to understand the causal effect of Z on Y, okay? Whatever Z is, whatever Y is, for simplicity, just assume that all of these quantities are, are scalars. Um, 
There are generally four categories, types of causal inference. One is a model-based approach, right? And you can use a model like a regression where you regress Y or Z on X, still uh, really popular. I would say the dominant approach. And sometimes it can be validated uh, causally with instrumental variables, par parallel trends, synthetic controls, kind of structural, people impose some structural assumptions on that. Still, it, these are model-based approaches. Um, another type of approach for causal inference is, is, is a so-called design-based approach. And surprisingly, uh, it's not as well known as the model-based approach. And it's surprising because I will say the design-based approach is more native to causal inference. Like historically, uh, causal inference, at least in statistics, originated from experimental design. And experimental design is, again, design is, design means how I really assign the treatment. So design-based approaches exploit the known variation in your design that don't try to rely so much on the model of the model of the what. Surprisingly though, even though it's more native to causal inference and also historically, um, uh, part of causal inference is not as well known or as well, um, um, let's say, um, preferred as model-based approaches. This has changed in recent years, especially through the works of economists like, uh, like Guido, uh, Guido Ibens, who is, uh, who's a proponent of design-based approaches. Um, still, um, still the debate kind of rages on, if you will. Uh, and the primary example is the randomized studies, right? When you do randomized studies, um, you want to do what we call randomization inference. You want to do your in, you want your inference to depend on what how the experiment was was done, and I will say it still remains uh, the gold standard of causal inference. I'm sure it's a controversial statement, perhaps, but um, um, I'm willing to talk about that over over coffee later. Um, third is causal graphs, big topic, not today, uh, forever, <laughs> um, and. Um, and the other is structural models, where um, uh, that will say it's a model-based approach on steroids, if you will, still very popular in macro policy making. Uh, what is that structural model or DSG, the, di the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium? These are just big models that try to predict how the system is going to evolve. Um, think about the uh, um, in the 2000s, for example, uh, there was a big debate on whether to introduce the, uh, the, the a common currency uh, in Europe. Right, and they use these gigantic models to uh, try to fit, like, and then compare what will happen to trade. Let's say if you introduce the common currency, and how will that will compare to uh, if you didn't introduce that common currency? Get okay, that, and based on those simulations, or at least partially based on those simulations, they, they made the decision to introduce the common currency. So still very popular and highly uh, impactful, I would say, uh, in public policy. But it kind of lives more in the macro uh, uh, econ world, not so much in the. Uh, uh, in the micro or in other, in other fields. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this tension between model-based and design-based, and um, I'll spend some time, um, let's say, praising the merits of the design-based approach, which uh, is going to be my, it's, it's my personal favorite, and I'll try to, to make the argument uh, for it. So in trying to compare between the model-based approach, and I want to do that, sorry, I want to do that because um, some solutions that I'm going to describe when it comes to interference, I'm going to employ a design-based approach. So I would like to introduce that first, especially for those who haven't seen that distinction before, uh, and then kind of show some design-based solutions for a, a causal inference when there's interference. Okay, why do I like um, the um, uh, design-based approach so much? Well, the model-based approach has some really important pitfalls. One, of course, is that it requires correct specification, okay? Uh, you need to have the correct model in order to rely on a model-based approach, like a regression or even machine learning, which is, uh, which is popular nowadays. Um, if you don't have the correct model, you're open to a lot of uh, biases. Like think about this decision to introduce the, the common uh, the currency in the entire Euro area, right? Like if you miss a factor, like an important factor in that big model, your conclusions, your results might be wi like widely misleading. Um, and they actually missed the factor. They missed the Greek factor. Nobody predicted that there will be that extra coefficient about uh, that, you know, Greece will go bankrupt in a, in, a few, in a few years, right? So, and it's hard to predict those things, right? Because there's so heterogeneous, so, so such a complex system. Um, another pernicious problem uh, is, but relates to the workshop uh, as well, is the quantification of uncertainty. Uh, something that's not as, as, as well known, I would say, but it's a, kind of a big problem in practice. And 
I could introduce some math here, but perhaps it, it, just, a, just a, a, an example can illustrate, can illustrate that problem. Suppose we have a completely randomized experiment, four units, half of them are in, in treatment here, half of them are in control. Treated units have an outcome of eight, uh, control units have an outcome of three, plus minus epsilon. Okay, you run a regression, y and z, causal effect uh, is plus five, okay? Um, it's, an ex it's an experiment, right? So economists actually would run a regression like that because it's an, ex an experiment, it was randomized, it has external validity, good, good. What is standard error of that regression? Well, if you look at that, if you try to visualize it, you have some numbers three here, and there's some others that are eight. So. Uh, for if you put them in a uh, and y by z uh, axis, okay. So the data fit a line very well for an epsilon that's zero. So the standard error that you get from standard LS, it's epsilon, essentially. So the smaller epsilon is in my outcomes, the larger my uncertainty. What happens here? is that the standard error estimation, the uncertainty quantification of this model approach, model-based approach is conflated with the model fit. In other words, the closer the data looks like a line, the smaller, the, the, the smaller my uh, uncertainty is. And for me, that's a, that's a deal breaker. The fact that it conflates the uncertainty with model fit, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a really uh, big problem. Um, so what can we do uh, with that? Well, here's a design-based approach, which as I said, it tries to, ex to, to exploit the actual variation in the experiments. Um, so the idea in, in design-based approach is to try to predict outcomes that will happen under kind of factual treatment assignments, and then try to compare it with what was actually observed. So in that data, for example, suppose the kind of factual was, was flipped, right? Suppose we treated the uh, units two and three, but we put the units one and four in control, kind of the, the flipped version of what I observed in the data. Actually, this um, experiment, this assignment, has the same probability as you know, what we observed. Okay? So it's an equally likely uh, kind of factual. So what will be the outcomes here, this y, y prime, under this kind of factual treatment assignment? Um, I don't really know, right? A model-based approach will try to predict it, right? But everything hinges on correct model specification. So what do you do? Well, design-based approaches say, okay, let me try to make a hypothesis about what's, what's going on here. Suppose, for example, that the treatment has no effect on the outcomes. Suppose that the, this vector Z is independent of the outcomes of Y. What will be the observed outcomes then? Well, I know that the observed outcomes will be exactly equal to what I observed in the sample. Right? It's just a logical uh, conclusion. So if the treatment has no effect on the outcomes, then this Y prime, the kind of factual outcomes will be exactly the same. So now I can impute those, those missing outcomes and I can redo my calculation all over again. Run a regression, if you will, or a machine learning model, anything. Um, now I can do this because I made a hypothesis and I used the logical conclusion of that hypothesis. No approximation so far. And if, if, you, if you did that, the, um, the uh, effect will be minus five, and not plus five. Okay? It will be the, the exact opposite. Now repeat that procedure for all possible six randomizations here, and you'll find no significance. Uh, because this effect that we observe, this plus five, although it's extreme, it has a 17% chance of happening. So it's not at all statistically significant. And compare that to the linear model that fit a line very well and said, oh, that there's, uh, this data, I'm sure these data are aligned. So uh, the kind of the center error was artificially very, very low, okay? And again, because it conflated the model fit with our certainty quantification, whereas the design-based approach does not do that. Why? Because it introduces no assumption. This is just, pure, in some sense, it's pure logic, right? If, again, if you, you make a hypothesis, you kind of test the implications of that hypothesis. Okay, so is it a general idea? It is, and um, it's called the Fisher's randomization test. And um, I think this idea is, is, should be, and these types of methods should be more well-known, especially for those who run experiments, because they have some really appealing properties that I'll just briefly discuss uh, soon. So how do you generalize this? Well, suppose you have a design. Uh, it's a probability distribution of the treatment. 
uh, can be as complex as you want, right? It could be a cluster design, saturation design, and something like really complex. This is called YI0, YI1, the potential outcomes under control and under treatment for a unit. And suppose we want to test the hypothesis that the treatment has no effect. So essentially your potential outcomes are exactly the same regardless of what treatments uh, you received. So what is a feature randomization test? It's generalization of that idea I described later. Step one, choose a test statistic, and that can be OLS, can be machine learning, any, anything from simple to complex. Um, doesn't really matter. The method is valid regardless of the choice of the test statistic. You build the randomization distribution. Basically, you just resample your treatment according to your design and you recalculate your, your statistic. And then you compare what you observed with what you, uh, with what you created, like the randomization distribution. Now, why do I praise this method so much? Because this method is valid in, in finite samples. It's exact, as we say. That's number one. Um, there's no asymptotics here. I'm not saying this in the limit. This is for any finite n. So it, it works well for a small sample. It works well with a large sample. That's why it's, it's preferred when you have an experiment it's actually preferred, especially when you do a medical trial, people will not even consider uh, applying a model. Uh, they just do things like that because it just don't, does not rely on asymptotics. Um, we don't need a correct Y model specification. Okay, and the test is robust in the sense that transform wise in kind of way in different, perhaps, perhaps there's a different scale of measurement, right? Perhaps the data were, were measured in terms of in the log scale. Usually the, uh, the answer is the same. In most cases, the answer that you get is the same. Run regression in the log scale instead of the normal, the natural scale, the results can, play, can, can change completely. Machine learning is also open to that. Like you change the scale, the, the, out, the, uh, the, the results can, 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 can vary widely. Um, so the, um, these randomization tests have that property of, of robustness. So all in all, if we talk about uncertainty quantification, which is you know, the, the, the topic of this workshop, this method is really, when of course it's possible to, to apply, is really, I will say the gold standard in uncertainty quantification because it's exact. It does not require any assumption uh, whatsoever, neither the model nor the asymptotics. Um, of course, there's no free lunch, right? There are some disadvantages. Uh, one is that it tests strong hypothesis. So what I, what I have over here is testing that the treatment has no effect whatsoever. But what if it, it had heterogeneous effect, right? What if we want to test the average treatment effect, like in, on, uh, like in the average of the population, not for every, every unit as you see here. Actually, there's a lot of research activity in that area. And a lot of recent evidence kind of points to the direction that even in those cases, the randomization approach can give you some robustness. Like it, it inherits the robustness of the original, uh, the classical randomization method. This big area, I'm not going to get into that. The other is coming mostly from uh, the economics world. Again, like economists will say, well, I don't really care about the sample, right? Whatever you're doing is in the sample. I want to know what will happen in the entire US. Right or in the, the entire states or the entire world. Uh, this is too, too restrictive for me. Um, and that's true, that's a, fair, that's a fair criticism. To me, that's more like, more like a feature, it's not a bug. Um, in the sense that um, if you have to understand when your inference, the, you have to understand the limits of your inference, right? Is the inference applies in your sample or, or in, in other words, what is the boundary after which you start speculating? Okay, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, later when I talk about the, uh, the meta given zone. Okay, so all in all, I, should, I will say the following. When it's possible to apply, and I cannot apply in, in all settings, but when it's possible to apply, I really think that this design-based approaches, especially this feature randomization test, the randomization test methods, should be in the toolkits uh, of every experimenter, of every analyst, uh, because it, when, when it's possible to do, they give you this exact uncertainty quantification much better than uh, model-based approaches. Okay, so if hopefully I have convinced you about the merits of that design-based approach, so I would like to, going forward, try to see how this method changes when interference comes into the mix, because so far I have made that assumption that I can really write uh, YA0, YA1, right? The, the uh, control potential outcome and the treatment uh, potential outcome. Now, even when you write this notation down, and there are people who don't really like uh, that notation, even they kind of consider it too speculative. Uh, Jerzy Neyman was, was one 
Uh, Peter McCullough is another. Um, anyway, kind of barring those kind of more foundational, let's say, uh, debates, um, when you write down even that, that notation, you, you kind of assume a way interference, right? Uh, you kind of assume, uh, assume a way that my out, the outcome for unit, y, uh, for unit I could depend on the outcomes of neighboring, neighboring units. Like, you know, remember that meta yin example, okay? So, and when there's treatment interference, uh, spillovers, dynamics, contagion, you cannot even write that down. Um, you, you need some different, different notation, right? You need some different definitions. Uh, so when there's interference, a unit is exposed to something more than individual treatments. It's, it's some kind of a net effect from the population treatment, like the markets, the city. Well, it's, it's uh, like think of, think of vaccine trial, right? A control unit is still protected by, uh, an unvaccinated person is still protected by a vaccinated person. That's another example of interference. Okay? And I described describe some examples uh, earlier. So, what do we do? How do we write down even these outcomes? Like what, how can we handle this type of complexity? Well, some kind of consensus I think that has emerged at least in the stats literature uh, has to do with this, the, this concept of, of treatment, treatment exposure. Um, and treatment exposure, I'm going to use FI of Z. This Z is the entire, the entire treatment of the population. And this FIZ, think of it as the summary uh, the net effect of the exposure that flows from the population into one unit. Yeah. And so the, the, the kind of literature, the consensus, or the literature has converged to considering that interference as mediated in some, in some way, as being summarized by a function, okay? So this is the entire population. Um, here are some examples, like in the standard setting where there, there's no interference, that exposure is really only your individual uh, treatment. Okay, that's the standard setting. But suppose there are households and then um, your exposure could be your own treatment plus the treatments of um, people in the, in the household. That's a cluster design uh, where a household is a cluster or could be the treatments of um, nearby cities. If you have, let's say, um, a randomization on the city level or it could be something that's um, uh, multi-valued, right? It could be your own treatments and the treatment in the household. So you can have an arbitrary definition. In, in, in general, this FIZ is the exposure has, is, is, is comprised by your own treatments and some summary, perhaps some numerical su summary, hopefully, of what happens in the population or the treatment population, okay? Now, although it's not necessary, it's useful to think that, you know, when you, this exposure, this perhaps high dimensional, multi-dimensional multi object is, is equal across two different assignments, your outcomes are going to be uh, equal as well. So if we fix that exposure um, across different assignments, your outcomes are going to be fixed. This known as exclusion restriction, effective treatment in Maskey's words, it's, it's, um, um, it's, it's an idea that has been around in, in general, like in statistics and economics. It's not an entirely new. Okay, how is that useful though um, in, in doing causal inference under interference? Well, one might say I can just take that and just run a regression again, right? Uh, well, again, that's a model-based approach. Now that we have all the problems that I described earlier and some more. So when you introduce exposure like that, and people do that actually, like they will write regressions where this will be, let's say the average treatments of your neighbors and run a regression like that. Now, there are some additional problems uh, to, well, well, in addition to these model-based uh, problems, some additional problems are you don't, you don't really know the correlation structure between these two things, right? This can be really complex objects. And also doing asymptotics based on that is, is also uh, entirely, uh, even intractable in most, in most cases. You have to impose some assumptions, perhaps on net, you need network asymptotics in many cases. So it can be really messy. So, and the uncertainty quantification, if it was problematic before, <laughs> it's going to be problematic, uh, even more problematic here. Sometimes even people put the outcomes, not the treatments, also the outcomes of your neighbors here, what they call linear and means, et cetera. That's a no-no. Uh, and uh, Josh Angus has an excellent article about the parallels of peer effects and the kind of progressions that people run. Uh, that's never, never, never a good idea because basically you just don't really know what this is estimating. Uh, we're in a territory where things are not even identified. So, um, okay. So if, we, if I convince you that the model-based approach is problematic, what can we do? Can we apply the design-based approach that I described earlier? 
In many cases, we can. And in cases where we want to, uh, to test whether the outcomes are equal for, diff for two different types of exposures, let's say. Okay. This null hypothesis, we can call them perhaps contrast hypothesis. Uh, they have appeared in the literature in many uh, different um, forms. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about one of that in the, in the Medigin example. Um, just before I describe that, I should say the following, that um, if we're going to test um, that, um, if, if, this, if this equivalence null hypothesis that we're going, we want to test is a subset of all the possible exposures, then we kind of run into problems. This is what we call a weak null hypothesis. But if we were testing that if this F naught here was equal to the entire set of possible exposures, then we will be back to this original FRT, right? We just kind of run the classical FRT, it will be completely fine. So the literature, uh, the recent literature has focused on testing this uh, kind of weak uh, null hypothesis. So let me give you an example, hopefully it will be uh, more clear. So suppose I go back to this meta again, I want to know whether there are spillover effects from nearby treated streets on controlled street, okay? How do I even write this down? Well, one way you can do this, that's kind of the approach we, we took, was to say, okay, let's focus on two kinds of exposures. I'm going to call them control spillovers and pure control. What's a pure control? Pure control is an ex a type of exposure where the unit, the street segment is in control and there's no treated street nearby. Okay. I don't think, oh, perhaps this one here. This one here could be a pure control street, right? Because there's no neighboring uh, treated uh, street. On the other hand, there are the, there is the exposure that we call control spillovers that is again a control street, but there is a nearby treated street. So that could be a control spillovers exposure, control spillovers exposure, control spillover exposure, and that will be a pure control. I would like to know whether the, there's any difference between those kinds of uh, streets and those kinds of streets in terms of crime outcomes, let's say, okay? So what I did so far is to define a language to describe spillover effects through that idea of treatment exposure. And as you can see here, this definition depends on my own treatment and the treatment that happens near me. Of course, these definitions can change, um, but Let's, let's, let's all agree that these are some reasonable definitions for treatment exposure, okay? Now, one thing here that, that you have to uh, uh, notice is that these are, not, these are not exhaustive, right? It's not only that control, they're, they're only, not only just these two types of spillovers. Um, you could be at a treated street and still have a spillover from a treated street, okay? So there are more types of uh, treatment exposures that we could have uh, introduced. But suppose let, you are a, a criminologist and you're interested only in these two types of effects. Okay. How would you test that? Well, if you try to use that Fisher and Mysticarian randomization test that I described earlier, you're going to have some problems. So what is the problem? Uh, here's just one example. Um, suppose this was the actual experiment. And suppose, remember what we did in the, in the example before, we just shuffled the treatment uh, vector, right? Suppose we do that. And in this shuffling, this unit here from, from red, it became blue. Right? Now I need again to think about what will be the kind of factual outcome. What will be the outcome of that street under this kind of factual treatment assignment? Well, the realization here is that my null hypothesis is not strong enough to tell me what that outcome is. Because remember, the null hypothesis only says that the outcomes under control spillovers are the same as pure control. That's it. It doesn't really, and, and both of these exposures require you to be in control. They, they tell me nothing about what happens when you are treated, when this ZI is equal to one. That's why we call it a weak null hypothesis. It doesn't really give me all the information that I, that I needed. Okay. So what do we do? Um, you cannot apply this classical design meth method um, um, just as easily. So the main insight of re recent literature is that you have to condition on a subset of your data, essentially. You have to use uh, a subset of the units, a subset of the assignments, and then perhaps do the randomization test in that subset. Essentially throw away some of your data. So that, 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 um, so you have to throw away some part of the data that it just cannot be, um, for which the, the null hypothesis is no, can, cannot give you any information for, essentially. Uh, how can you do this conditioning? Like how, what subset of, of your data to, to focus on? 
Uh, well, actually, in this type of problems, there is a nice trick that you can do that reduces a problem from a statistical one to a computational one. Uh, and it goes like this. So you put the, the units of your analysis, in our case, it's the street segments on one side. We take all the possible uh, treatment assignments on the other side. So here, uh, just a clarification, this, this bullet here is not, uh, this, is on, this is not an individual treatment. This corresponds to population treatment, like an entire, think of this as an entire vector for the entire population. So you put this on one side, the units, and then this population treatment assignments on the other side. And you connect the units and an assignment with an edge if this unit under that ass assignment is exposed to the exposures defined in the null hypothesis. And you just draw an edge. And you do that for all possible combinations. We call this the null exposure graph. And so far, again, I'm not making any assumption about the model, any assumption about the, this is really the, the, the logical structure of your statistical problem encoded in a graph, essentially. Okay. And by looking at it, it gives you a lot of valuable information. For example, the more dense this graph is, it means that the more units are exposed to the exposure to your null hypothesis, the more information you have to test your scientific uh, hypothesis. If this was empty, it would be impossible to answer your null hypothesis. So in some sense, it's also, it gives you information, it illustrates, it makes it transparent how much information you have for your scientific problem of interest, something that's really hidden, uh, obfuscated by a model-based approach. Because a model-based approach is going to, to grab your data and kind of give you an answer, okay? But um, in the process, it might be doing extrapolations that you don't want to be making. I'll, I'll give a concrete example later. Um, and so, and next here, another important um, uh, observation here is that the edge is also equivalent to imputability, which means the following that essentially, if you want to run the feature anonymization test for these types of null hypothesis, you're looking for a byte click in that graph representation. Essentially, your statistical problem becomes a computational one. You find a byte click in that, in that graph, and then you run uh, the, again, you just run the classical method as, as, as usual. Okay, why a by click? Because a by click means that all the units are connected to all the assignments in that by click. And why is this important? Because in a by click, this means that uh, you can make those imputations. Uh, these imputations are possible across assignments. This is Z prime and Y prime. These are possible only uh, in a by click. So it's an if and only if actually. Um, and so here's how you, you change that classical FRT. You calculate the any graph. You take that click, this by click that contains the treatment, the observed treatment assignment, and you run your feature test in uh, your randomization test in that by click. So essentially, this is a trick, it's an algorithm to automate how, how to subset the data in order to test your hypothesis and run this design based approach that uh, you know, has this nice appealing properties. Okay. Other than that, is the classical, the classical method. And so it inherits all the nice properties of robustness. Etc. of the randomization tests. Here's how this looks like in the Medellin example. This is the city of Medellin and every dot here is a, is a street segment. The blue ones are treated units. The uh, light blue are um, control spillovers. These are, these are streets here. This light blue are streets that were assigned to the baseline policing, but they have nearby streets that have had intensive policing. Um, and the, uh, this navy blue here are pure control units. These are units that are in control and they don't have treated streets nearby. This red one are the focal units. As we say, the literature has conversed into to that, to that, to that terminology. Focal units means that this is a subset of your data that will give you, that will help you test your null hypothesis. Uh, essentially, we're going to run our randomization test only in this uh, green uh, dots essentially, which are some of them are in the uh, outskirts and some of them are in the center. Okay, why is this picture is so important? Because it tells you it tells you that the structure, the, the subset of the data that's relevant to your scientific hypothesis, your scientific hypothesis, has a very complex structure. And if you try to run a regression immediately on, on all your data, essentially you're going to be using those uh, the non-green dots, and when you use the non-green dots, you're extrapolating necessarily, no doubt about it. You're going to use the model to extrapolate to, to those units, whereas the randomization test in some sense is honest, honestly tells you, look, 
look, man, this is, this is the, the only thing that I can do here. These are the only units that are, ex are exposed or could be exposed to the exposures that you want to the interference effects you're interested in. Yes. Yes. Can you clear windows with five chips that you're talking about? So if I've got this whole bike chip in transition, how do I, if I'm pooping the randomization for cross bike chips, right, to sort of make some inference uh, on, you know, whether I'm violating the null or not, it feels like if I'm pooling things across them, I have to make further assumptions on F, right? Because otherwise, how do I, right? Like, so imagine I had, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, and I have a bike click for one, two, and a bike click for three, four. Right, and so you, you can you can perform inference on, on you know one two. You perform inference on three four, and you can speak to uh, rejection uh, mm -hmm. in either of those groups. Mm -hmm. But ideally, you want to talk about rejection across the whole thing, and I don't understand how you talk about yeah. rejection collectively without. That, that's an excellent that. point. It, uh, well, the uh, the actual method that we propose is I kind of hid the details. Um, you build this graph. Then we do this decomposition, as you mentioned. Essentially, I take this graph and I decompose it into different byte clicks. But then only one byte click contains the observed uh -huh. uh, treatment assignment. There's only one Got subset. It. So, so I don't have to pull it around. Uh, yes. Um, and you have to do that because of validity reasons. Uh, it's, it's, it's more technical, but it's, it's an excellent question. Question Are we also defining the hypothesis in the sense that you're looking at the particular byte? White clicks, right? It, going back to your example, so this this could be only strips that have two adjacent strips that are treated, right? So we can only talk about like the hypothesis would be is the treatment affected only in this very particular situation, right? So we can't say anything. About yes, that's right, and that's the criticism of uh, your your um, your formulation being too restrictive, right? Uh, and uh, I I fully fully accept that, uh, but in in a sense. You know, if you want to build, in a sense, this is the inherent trade-off of that trade-off of that method. It tells you, I can test something really exactly, uh, no, no assumptions, no asymptotics, but it has to be something restricted. I cannot say anything about other treatment exposures or other units. Even not like directionally, or am I going to underestimate or overestimate or anything? Right? Yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is. Um, Okay, so, but again, I want to, to emphasize the complex structure here. A regression method will never figure out that these are the units that are relevant to my specific null hypothesis and will and do extrapolations that perhaps we didn't intend to. Um, here's a spin off of these ideas is first of all, we could use that method to uh, warn the user when you try to do this type of extrapolation. Um, and there was a paper about the effects of large scale social media advertising in, uh, with COVID infections. That was by Breza et al at Nature. Um, so essentially they had um, an advertising campaign uh, of, uh, across states uh, in order to vaccinate, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted to estimate, uh, part of that was to estimate peer effects, uh, spillover effects between states of these advertising campaigns. And they used a regression based approach. Okay, fine, I don't want to be a negative, uh, to a very negative person. Um, however, you could use that method to figure out the, the size of the sizes of these bike clicks, right? So, and this is the plot using their data that kind of gives you the trade-off, let's say that, that um, of, of, of your problem. So essentially every point, so this point here, this, this curve here corresponds to different combinations of assignments and units. These are bike click, essentially the, the, the size of the bike click um, where, uh, they tell you how many units you can use to test your, your particular null hypothesis. Uh, and so um, this tells you that, for example, um, in, in, in their particular case, uh, in this particular point here, uh, you could have a situation where you have 10 focal units and only 10 assignments. It's a really small um, bike, very small bike click size, which tells you that you might be extrapolating too much. I'm not saying that the, the paper is actually extrapolating too much, but it's more like a, a diagnostic, right? You definitely will, will prefer to be, um, you definitely prefer curves that are kind of higher, right? Uh, the, the more units you have, the more assignments you have in this test, the better it is, the, the more kind of honest information, let's say, uh, is that you're using. Another spin-off is um, for improving experimental design. So even before anything starts, even before you observe outcomes, uh, remember this, this, this graph that I described, is really a reflection of the problem structure. I haven't, uh, we haven't assumed anything about the model itself. 
is really the, you know, kind of encodes how difficult your, your problem is. So you could try to have a parameter space for your, for your experimental design and try to find that experimental design that gives you the, the bigger bike, essentially. Okay, and so bigger by clicks hopefully will mean more powerful methods. And here's an example where what I show you here on the right, this, this kind of show you uh, on these two axes, we have the parameter space. So P0 in the Medellin example, P0 will be the probability of treating a street in the outskirts and P1 will be the probability of treating a street in the center. Suppose this very simple design space. And you can kind of plot that and show that uh, where do I get the largest by clicks? Okay, kind of this is this this is the more shaded area, and using a simulated model for the outcomes, you can see that there's a correlation between the power I compute from the simulated y model to what I compute from the uh, this by click uh, uh, kind of uh, algorithm. This tells you this kind of picture tells you that you could use this by click decompositions in order to optimize an experimental design essentially, and you could prefer experimental designs that lead to um, bigger by clicks. Okay, uh, I don't think I have too much uh, uh, time. One minute, okay. So I was planning to talk about this habituation effects, uh, which are pretty, um, as I said, it's, it's a big problem in, in, uh, uh, in uh, kind of on com online commerce, especially. There was a nice paper at Hong Kong et al from, from Google where they wanted to estimate this eye, eye blindness, right? Like the effect that would people get, get a treatment, but then they kind of start habituating uh, on it. Um, and they have some interesting examples. They kind of have different experimental designs. This was, um, now your, your treatment is temporal. It's kind of over time. Uh, this will be the, where you get the treatment across different, uh, across all time periods, et cetera. Um, and what I want you only to, to, to say here is perhaps that um, we kind of analyzed experiments like that and we kind of, um, uh, worked on, on finding minimax experimental designs. Uh, and kind of uh, the, the, the main finding there was that the minimax design, when you want to estimate this type of habituation effects that we focused on, is still a completely randomized design, but it's imbalanced, um, depending on uh, imbalanced across uh, these different types of um, uh, assignments. Um, so I know it's, it's, too, it's too, too brief, it's too, um, I'm going too fast, but uh, just, give, just give you an idea that we worked on kind of minimax experimental design in that area as well, which is a special type of movement. Okay, so let me wrap up. Uh, uh, just uh, hopefully give you some taste of what causal inference is in, in complex systems. Uh, and, and again, I will to repeat that it's in complex, it is cause, this type of causal inference is, is underdeveloped. Um, standard practice so far kind of assumes away this interference and in complex uh, treatment dynamics, habituation, and things like that. Um, now, what I presented here is only just a tiny sample of what, what's possible. I didn't talk about strategic behaviors, marketplace dynamics, many different things that, uh, that you could do. Um, and uh, we just were able to work on these issues like the policing experiment in Medellin or the, uh, uh, these habituation effects um, and designs with habituation effects. Um, and with that, I can give a sh uh, shout out to my uh, excellent collaborators, Guillaume Bass, he's, he's not here, he used to be at Stanford. Um, Avi Feller, he's, uh, he's, he's close, hey, hey Avi. Um, uh, Pong Ding, who's um, uh, at Berkeley Stats as well. David Parks, who's at uh, Harvard EconCS. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Uh, we'll take questions offline. Uh, let's thank uh, both Thanos and Vivek again. Uh, we'll be back at 11.15.